afternoon. I'm Lorna Lucas, Director of Provider Education for the Association of Community Cancer Centers, and I'm eager to introduce Dr. Ari Vanderwald as our expert presenter in the seventh E course hosted by the Institute for Clinical Immuno Oncology, or ICLEO. And as you may know, ICLEO is an institute of ACCC and is the only initiative to prepare multidisciplinary cancer care providers for the complex implementation of immuno oncology in the community setting. The iCLEO program provides a host of educational resources and tools, such as webinar today, newsletters, e-learning module courses, tumor subcommittee updates, and coming soon, an immersive IO preceptorship and live meetings. And speaking of live meetings, I hope you'll join us for the second iCLEO National Conference, which is scheduled for September 30th, so a week from today, in Philadelphia. And you can access all of our resources and register for the conference at accc-iCLEO.org. Now for today's e-course, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Vanderwald, who's the Director of Clinical Research at the West Cancer Center, as well as Assistant Professor of Hematology Oncology and Associate Vice Chancellor of Clinical Research at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. Dr. Vanderwald's vision is to take novel promising therapies and translate them systematically and efficiently into agents that achieve tangible benefits for people with cancer. As an expert in melanoma, Dr. Vanderwald has collaborated with some of the nation's thought leaders and participate on advisory boards with top experts in the field. Now for a few housekeeping notes, please feel free to submit questions that you have for our presenter by typing them in the question box on your dashboard. I will pose the questions to Dr. Vanderwald at the conclusion of the presentation. This webinar will be archived and available on the iCLEO website. So now I'll send it over to Dr. Vanderwald to kick off the webinar. So hi everybody. Um, you, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. The one thing that you did not include is that, in addition to me, you're getting my really squeaky chair. So if you hear anything that sounds really squeaky, that's my chair trying to get a word in edgewise. So I apologize in advance. Um, next slide, please. Is it advancing? I don't see anything. It looks like I'm just having a little difficulty advancing the slide on my computer. I'll give it one second and see. Okay. Yeah, it looks like my computer froze. Um, well, I can talk a little bit about it before, if you'd like. Um, I can talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about um, before we advance the slide. Okay, so, that was great. Thank you. So I'm going to give a little bit of a review over um, immunotherapy and melanoma, if that's okay with everybody. Um, many people uh, in the community and, and elsewhere have really had immunotherapy sort of hit your armamentarium with lung cancer, um, but the data all started in melanoma, and as I'm a melanoma expert, I get to toot our own horn a little bit in melanoma to talk a little bit about where our data are and where we're going. And the other um, areas uh, of, of oncology, including lung cancer, head and neck cancer, bladder cancer, soon kidney cancer, all of those are learning from what has already been done in melanoma as well as beginning to push the envelope as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about what we know about single agent immunotherapy um, and why we use what we use. We'll talk a little bit about combination immunotherapy and when we decide to use it and when we decide maybe not to use it. We'll talk a lot about side effects. Um, and uh, we'll go through about three case studies that will help lead our discussion all of whom are patients that, that we've seen here in our practice in Memphis. Um, two of these cases are in treatment of melanoma. One of them is going to be in lung cancer, and that would reflect a lot more of what many people would see in their practice. At West Cancer Center, we've um, treated about 400 patients with immunotherapy in the last two years. The overwhelming majority of them are with lung cancer, which is appropriate since we're a hybrid uh, academic community center, and so we see a lot of lung cancer. Um, and uh, we've had quite a few interesting side effects here, as well as a number of routine side effects. And as is always the case when you go real world, we've also seen some side effects that we're still, to this day, not sure whether or not they're truly side effects or they're progressive disease or they're totally unrelated. And I'll share one of those cases with you as well. Hi, Dr. Vanderwald. Again, I apologize for the difficulties we're having our, on our end. Um, is it at all possible, Dr. Vanderwald, if we give you the presenter role and you can pull up the slides? Sure. That would be great. Sorry about that, everyone. 
I'll just wait for you to make me presenter. Is it showing? Yes, it is now showing. Okay. Did the slide advance? Yes, it did. Okay, excellent. Thank so you. we're going to start with um, what is in the immunotherapy world considered extremely old data, all the way back from 2010 when Steve Hody published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is the first um, modern age immunotherapy that we've been using. And this doesn't include interferon or, or IL-2, um, but in the modern age of checkpoint inhibition. Uh, these are the pivotal study, well, this is the major pivotal study and one other study that never really kind of took off, um, looking at ipilimumab as compared to best available alternative therapy. The study that was that uh, ipilimumab, which is a CTLA-4 inhibitor, was approved based on was um, in patients who had all failed the carbazine, which many of you might remember was the standard of care for melanoma up until this study. And uh, these patients were randomized to receive either ipilimumab versus um, GP100, which was sort of an active peptide vaccine, or the combination. And what was seen, um, and what's really important, is if you look over here at, at A in the top left corner, there was an overall survival benefit for both the combination arm as well as the single agent ipilimumab arm that was significant both clinically and non-clinically from uh, the GP100 alone arm or placebo. And what's really important here, and you'll hear this over and over again, is the shape of the curve. Most PFS or OS curves that we see tend to show a um, early, early difference between the two curves that ultimately then combine with one another. Immunotherapy curves, as they start with this very first curve, show a early togetherness of the curve and then a late separation and then a maintained separation over time. And that's why in immunotherapy we talk about what's called the tail of the curve, which is when the curve has separated and stays separated. These data have, have lasted. These are relatively mature data at this point. And we now know that patients with ipilimumab, even as a single agent who have received ipilimumab, have a 10-year survival of up to about 20%. So almost to the point where immunotherapy, despite the fact that the response rates are relatively low, if a response is seen or if the patient is, does not have progression, the, the response can last for a very long time. Um, if, and even potentially even use the magic C word or cure. Um, what's really important though, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, is that there was no difference at all seen in the progression-free survival curves. And so there were a number of different uh, possible reasons why this could have occurred, but the major reason is a phenomenon that we nowadays refer to as pseudoprogression, although pseudoprogression, I believe, is a misnomer, where because immunotherapy takes a while to achieve the immune effect that it's looking for, the tumor will continue to grow in the early periods of immune therapy. So you'll see progression before you see response. As all of you know, a progression-free survival curve basically gives the end date at the time of first progression. However, if they would have looked at second progression, meaning the patient's continued therapy or waited a little bit longer before they actually were willing to kind of throw out the therapy, you'd see that patients who early progressed ultimately then went on to either respond or went on to have a slowing of progression to the point where the patients ultimately translated into an overall survival benefit in some minority of the patients. The slide set on the right is, um, is a higher dose of ipilimumab combined with the best available therapy at the time, which is decarbazine. This is really an artifact. We're not giving ipilimumab in, in combination with decarbazine in any malignancy at all, but, uh, and we're somewhat careful about giving ipilimumab 10 milligrams per kilogram in general as well, but this did show that you could give ipilimumab in the front line and ultimately was led to the approval of ipilimumab in any line of therapy in melanoma um, in 2011. And I almost said next slide, but then I realized that I had them. So hopefully you can all see the next slide. Very rapidly after this watershed moment, um, we discovered another set, uh, checkpoint inhibitor um, pathway, which is the PD-1, PD-L1 uh, axis. And you can see here the, both the early data for um, nivolumab, which is the BMS version, Opdivo, of PD-1, as well as more recent data of, from pembrolizumab that was presented at ASCO this past year um, that show that um, 
after failure of ipilimumab, these patients have a significant benefit, both from a clinical perspective as well as from a uh, as well as from a statistical perspective, as compared to decarbazine. Um, I would draw your attention to both the OS curve for nivolumab, where you can see that there is a huge difference between nivolumab and decarbazine, where uh, the curves separate at about three months and then continue, and the um, number of patients that are surviving at 18 months is still well over 50% for nivolumab, whereas that curve has really begun to approach zero for decarbazine. Um, but also in progression-free survival, where the curves stay together for the first few months, and then ultimately they they also begin to diverge from one another, drawing us to the conclusion that is still somewhat early, but has uh, led us to the understanding that this sort of progression before response tends to happen a little bit less often with the PD-1s than it happens with ipilimumab and the CTLA-4 inhibitors. Not that it shouldn't mechanistically happen, it's just that we tend to see responses with PD-1s a little bit earlier than we see responses with, with CTLA-4. And so you tend not to have to worry about pseudoprogression as much with PD-1 blockade. Um, as we have more data, we also see that the curve is beginning to start to flatten out for overall survival. Um, this, uh, on the right, we see uh, uh, Carolyn Robert's presentation at ASCO in 2016, just a few months ago, where we see that in patients who receive single-agent pembrolizumab after failure of ipilimumab, um, you can see even at 36 months, there's still a 40% overall survival, and it looks like that shape of the curve is beginning to maybe start to flatten out, just like we saw with ipilimumab. Um, so the question then, of course, becomes, well, now we know that both ipilimumab is better than, ke than chemotherapy and PD-1 inhibitors are better than chemotherapy, but which one is better than each other? So there was a, a trial that was performed um, to look to see whether or not PD-1 inhibitors are better than ipilimumab. And the first set of trials was single-agent PD-1 versus um, versus ipilimumab, and both of those have shown benefit of PD-1 as compared to ipilimumab in the, in the first line. Um, the first study was looking at two different doses of pembrolizumab, and you can see that on top, and that shows a, um, a, a difference in the curve for PFS as compared to ipilimumab. Um, and both of these, as you can see, have very long tails of the curve that are above 0%, so you can see that sort of uh, immunotherapy long-term, almost like vaccine protection effect. And then uh, more notably, um, uh, Carolyn Robert had an article in the New England Journal in 2015 that showed an overall survival benefit of both ARMS and pembrolizumab as compared to uh, ipilimumab alone. And this is data showing that a PD-1 inhibitor alone is better than ipilimumab in the front line. That change therapy such that it is no longer appropriate based on overall survival data, which is as gold standard as we can get, to give patients ipilimumab in the front line anymore in, in melanoma, it should be a PD-1 inhibitor at containing regimen in the front line. So dual checkpoint blockade is what everybody is talking about now, and that was approved um, le uh, last, I guess, fiscal year, um, that was looking to see whether or not combining them is better than either agent alone. Of course, nobody wanted to really put all their cards in the in the on the table right away, so they statistically designed these studies to compare to ipilimumab alone, um, and we're kind of stuck scratching our heads to some extent as to whether or not there's a difference in the com comparison with the PD-1. The first study was a phase two study that was published by, um, by POSTO in the New England Journal, um, looking at the combination of nivolumab plus ipilimumab as compared to ipilimumab alone. The data was mature enough to report progression-free survival about a year and a half ago, and it showed that there's a significant benefit in progression-free survival with the combination as compared to ipilimumab alone, and these were the data that ultimately led to FDA approval. The, um, the, the big splash in the field came at ASCO of 2015 when um, Jed Wolchuk presented the combination data in a phase three study, in the Checkmate 067 study, that showed um, a comparison, again, between the combination versus ipilimumab alone from a statistical perspective, but there was a third arm of nivolumab alone. And what this showed also was a statistically and clinically significant benefit of the combination as compared to ipilimumab for progression-free survival, but the suggestion, at least, of a benefit between, uh, for progression-free survival between uh, nivolumab plus ipilimumab combination even compared to nivolumab alone. Um, 
with a little bit of time, you can see that the differences between these curves might not be as notable as they had been in the past. And we'll talk about that when we talk about our cases and decision making. So to get into the cases, now that we have a uh, good three quarters of our, of our uh, discussion left, um, this is a little bit more of a standard case, and I'll just read it because this is the patient that we saw in our hospital. This was a 61-year-old man with melanoma who was recently treated with a combination of ivalumumab and nivolumab. After the fourth cycle, he developed chills and a low-grade temperature. Um, the temperature resolved and the chills resolved. Then soon thereafter, he started to report increased tiredness um, and more shortness of breath. Uh, that was somewhat insidious as it progressed, even to the point, but after about seven days, he was at the point where he was having conversational dyspnea, um, which uh, is somewhat severe and was noted by, his, uh, by, by us in the clinic. Um, he had a chest x-ray that was done in the clinic. It showed uh, the interpretation was a lower lobe pneumonia. He got a ceftriaxone injection and they gave him a prescription for augmentin and flagyl. Um, his symptoms continued to worsen and he went to his primary doctor because obviously the oncologist didn't help him right away. His pulse ox was 89% on room air. Um, and then when we saw him in the emergency room, he complained of a dry cough, but he had no nausea or vomiting. He had some dry, uh, dry crackles in his middle to lower lung field. And another chest x-ray done in the emergency room showed a bilateral pulmonary, bilateral pulmonary infiltrates. A chest CT revealed um, what you can see here, but ultimately diffuse pneumonitis. And the radiologist even wrote that they favor infectious etiology. So, this is what ended up happening with the patient. So just a, a little bit more about his cancer. Um, he doesn't really have that much of a past medical history. He doesn't have a lot of history of any, he doesn't have a history of interstitial lung disease, doesn't have a history of, of uh, any other type of, of lung issues. Um, his cancer was diagnosed initially in 2012 where he noticed, well, not diagnosed, I'm sorry. He started having symptoms in 2012 when he noticed left axillary lymphadenopathy. Um, he noted his size, size increase in some pain that started in 2014. In early 2015, he had a lymph node biopsy that showed melanoma. Nobody could find the primary, and he had an axillary lymph node dissection at that time. About four months later, he was found to have brain metastases, and he was treated with local uh, uh, GABA knife um, by radiation oncologists. He then no longer had any measurable disease whatsoever, but his oncologist at that time treated him with a uh, combination to brafinib and trametinib for eight months. He had good response, but ended up stopping because of side of, uh, severe side effects with high fevers. Um, and ultimately, toward the end of the year, after eight months, they stopped the drug. Um, he went on a treatment holiday uh, for about six months with disease that remained well controlled. Maybe there was a slight recurrence in the brain. And then in about uh, May of 2016, he started on uh, combination immunotherapy with ipilimumab plus nivolumab. Um, as there was concern that he had some pleural disease at that time, too. In 2015, his tumor showed a lymph node that was uh, totally replaced by atypical melanocytes and, and uh, invasive melanoma. As you could probably gather from the fact that we treated him with the brafinib and trametinib, he had a BRAF V600E mutation. And looking back at his molecular profiling, we can see that using the commercial test that we used there, and this is not an FDA-approved test, but this was one that we had access to, he had PDL1 of 50% positive for whatever that means. So he was admitted to the hospital. Even in the hospital, he was started on broad spectrum antibiotics. They got blood cultures and urine cultures, and they started him on duonab just because. Um, 48 hours after hospitalization, he still had no clinical improvement. He still had opacities on the chest X-ray. At that time, this is now about 10 days after his first onset of, of uh, symptoms, he's probably seen about six doctors by this point. Um, and he finally began prednisone of 100 milligrams, um, which was about a milligram per kilogram, and he started having resolution of his symptoms within one day. Um, he was discharged a few days later, and all antibiotics were stopped at discharge. He was continued on high doses of steroids with a very slow taper um, over the course of the four weeks, and his nivolumab was held. Um, now, if you remember, he had gotten four doses of ipilimumab plus nivolumab, the ipilimumab plus nivolumab dosing is it's four doses of ipilimumab, three milligrams per kilogram, together with one milligram per kilogram of nivolumab every three weeks for four doses. After four doses, you switch over to every two-week nivolumab, three milligrams per kilogram. Very recently, the FDA changed, uh, changed the dose of that to a flat dose of 240 milligrams IV. Um, but the nivolumab is supposed to continue indefinitely um, 
whereas the uh, ipilimumab is supposed to be stopped after four doses, and that's the take-home point. This, this uh, patient had to stop the nivolumab because of the side effect and has not gotten nivolumab since. So it's easy to be able to be a Monday morning quarterback in a case like this. This is a classic case of autoimmune pneumonitis that we see very commonly um, in patients who are treated with, uh, with um, a PD-1 inhibitor. And I say very commonly, although that goes against what the trials say, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, but what's really important for us to realize is what is the pretest probability? When you have a patient who's been treated for, uh, with immunotherapy for any reason, and this happened to be in melanoma, but it's very true in lung cancer as well, where there's already a lung insult in many of the cases, where you have a patient who starts having dyspnea or other symptoms of, of, uh, of intrathoracic disease of some kind or another, when should you be thinking about autoimmunity? And um, does it matter whether they got combination immunotherapy or single agent immunotherapy? And does it matter which immunotherapy they got? It's easy for me, and I'm going to avoid trying to lord it over the treating oncologist who, for all you know, was actually me, that they should have known better. Um, but let's look at the numbers a little bit so that we can see. Um, and this wasn't just one oncologist, by the way, who made this mistake. This was a series of physicians all of whom, for whatever reason, decided that this was infection. Um, over and over and over again, they made this decision. They treated him for infection. They continued to assume it was infection. And ultimately, they found it wasn't infection. Luckily, this patient did not have uh, long-term sequelae from this and is still in response, by the way, um, from his combination immunotherapy, despite the fact that he did not receive uh, continued nivolumab following ipilimumab. So these are the data that we see in the combination trial. This is the trial, this is the phase three trial um, published by Dr. Larkin in the New England Journal in 2015 as well. You can see the red box that I mostly made fit um, that shows that um, the dyspnea, which actually was what I meant to circle and somehow the, the formatting changed, um, the rate of dyspnea in the middle columns, which is in the columns of nivolumab plus ipilimumab, shows that any grade of dyspnea was about 10%, and only two patients had three or grade three or four dyspnea, meaning to the point that they needed to be hospitalized, or 0.6%. That's pretty low, um, even in the combination arm. Compared to nivolumab alone, it's double, but again, these numbers are very small. Um, nivolumab alone, there was one case, or 0.3% of grade three or four uh, pneumonitis. So generally speaking, what we see here is despite the fact that these rates are low, they're about double the rate of pneumonitis, and we're only looking at pneumonitis in this graph as defined by dyspnea because they didn't publish their pneumonitis rates, maybe because they weren't high enough to be considered an event of interest in this study. But you can see that everything is pretty much doubled. It goes from 4.5% of any grade with nivolumab alone to 10.2% of any grade with the combination, and it goes from 0.3% of high grade to 0.6% of high grade. So one could then argue that if the nivolumab cases are somewhat muted in this clinical trial, then very likely the combination cases are also muted. This is a meta-analysis that was published very recently um, looking at a number of different trials, looking at pneumonitis in patients uh, with combination immunotherapy. And you can see that um, in the combination arms, and again, these boxes ended up in places that I wasn't really intending them to be. Um, but in the immunotherapy arms, you can see that the Wolchuk um, et al. presentation initially showed an all-grade pneumonitis in the combination um, of 1.9%. And I'm going to just, I don't know if you guys can see my, my circle mouse, um, but I'm pointing at this. This was sequential and so not relevant. And if I could move this up, I would. Um, all-grade pneumonitis was 5.7%. 2% of grade three or higher pneumonitis, and this was the phase one study of the combination. Um, how the POSTA article was the phase two uh, uh, version, and you can see that the rate of grade three or higher pneumonitis was 3.2%, again, with about a 10% risk of all grade pneumonitis. And the phase three article, which we just talked about, um, they're calling pneumonitis at 6.4% with grade three pneumonitis at 1%. And again, this is their pneumonitis report, not the dyspnea report, and there's a little bit of overlap between those two, as would be expected. So that's what these data show. Um, so the likelihood of developing pneumonitis or developing immune-mediated side effects in general with combination immunotherapy is about double for any 
or any one side effect, whether that be colitis, pneumonitis, endocrinitis, it's about double. So you're doubling your rate of side effects, you're doubling your risk of high grade side effects by giving the combination. So the question then becomes, should we have been giving this patient combination immunotherapy? And how do we know whether or not combination immunotherapy is the right choice in each individual patient? Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to skip to the end a little bit here, just so that you don't feel like I'm trying to lord any of this over you. The answer is we really have absolutely no idea, but we guess. Um, and what's interesting is that melanoma experts tend to be somewhat cautious about the combination. Um, and this is one of the cases in which we've seen in sort of post hoc analyses that community doctors tend to be a little bit less cautious than, than melanoma uh, specialists do in this case. None of us are really sure why. Um, it might be that the data presented was really heavy on the efficacy part and didn't talk that much about the safety part. Also, melanoma medical oncologists tend to be immunologists who are so used to not being able to benefit patients that they're often looking at side effects more than they're even looking at efficacy. I honestly don't know. It's more a sociological phenomenon than it is a scientific phenomenon, and I really can't explain it. But I can at least talk about how I try to do it. So should this patient have received combination immunotherapy? Let me start with these. So these are the breakdowns of different subsets of patients in the Larkin article, which was the phase three study of immunotherapy combination. And what you can see looking at the bottom is this looks very similar here. This is in patients who are PD-L1 negative. And I don't know what that necessarily means, but let's assume that we're going to use their definition, which is using BMS's assay at a 5% cutoff. And you can see that progression-free survival over here um, is at least numerically and visually better in the combination than it is with nivolumab alone. Um, the blue is nivolumab alone. The, 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 the little brown dots are the combination. Um, we all know everything is better than nivolumab, so it's fine. Um, in pdl one positive tumors, however, these curves are totally overlapping, and you can't see a PFS benefit at all um, with nivolumab as compared to uh, uh, nivolumab plus ipilimumab. Well, the drug company people would have you say, or scientists who really believe that there is a difference, and I'm not making a claim that one is in any way influenced by the other, um, there's still a difference in objective response rate that you can see here, um, where the combination, even in PDL1 high patients, the combination had a response rate of 72%, whereas nivolumab alone had a response rate of 57%. And maybe that's where we should be looking at the meaningful outcome is actually reject objective response rate and not progression-free survival. However, the problem with that is that we know that the combination leads to responses that happen more quickly. So it's possible that what you're seeing here is an artifact, that nivolumab actually, you do have a response rate that is quite good in pdl one high patients. However, you're not seeing it because those are the patients that you're more likely to scan and see progression before response. And in the typical progression-free survival uh, or objective response rate measure, your first diagnosis of progressive disease is your only diagno is your diagnosis. So if you didn't respond prior to having progressive disease, that does not count as an objective response. However, if you have progressive disease and then you respond later on after continuing the drugs, that wouldn't count as a response in the way that they did it in this paper. So it's possible that this rate of 57.5% is actually low um, in pdl one high. And in addition, it's not clear whether or not objective response rate or, or PFS is the more relevant measure. We really don't know. The other take-home message is that in patients, with, um, in patients with melanoma in general, the response rate to nivolumab is in the 40 to 50% range, depending on pdl one high or low. And that's really important because the, the added benefit of adding ipilimumab is not double by any stretch of the imagination. It's more likely about a 50% increase in response rate, which means that you're doubling toxicity and you're increasing efficacy by about 50%. And we don't know which patients actually need it. And we're not talking about toxicities here that are benign toxicities. They're toxicities that are confusing for the patient, confusing for the physician, definitely confusing for an emergency room and um, can be very life-threatening or even life-ending in certain cases. So let's talk about the endpoint that's actually important because let's say, you know, we're going to make it a draw. Let's say pdl one is the same for PFS, but it's different for OS. So let's let that for, uh, for objective response rate. 
So let's let uh, overall survival be the, be the guide. Well, we don't have overall survival data on the combination as compared to single agent PD-1, but we do have overall survival preliminary data um, with the combinations compared to ipilimumab. What's interesting about this is that based on the data that was presented at AACR this past year, there isn't even a difference in, a, in overall survival yet that has been shown with the combination, even compared to ipilimumab. Now, if you remember, I'm going to go back to this slide, look at how far apart the PFS curves are with ipilimumab with the combination. They're really far apart, and yet we still haven't even shown an overall survival benefit here. So while we don't have these data yet, my general suspicion is that we're not going to see a pronounced overall survival benefit with the combination as compared to single agent PD-1. Um, that's not to say that there isn't a role for combination immunotherapy. There absolutely is, but we just have to tread lightly. So let's talk a little bit about what the real rates of toxicity are. And if you recall, when I was talking about before, we were looking at the clinical trial rates. It showed a toxicity of about 10% of less than grade 3 toxicity and uh, less than 1% of pneumonitis in all the cases that were done. But when you look at overall toxicity in general, the rates in the community are, even not in the community, but the rates off of clinical trial are much worse than how we're seeing in the clinical trials. This was a poster that was presented by Jed Wolchok. And if, uh, and if you remember, um, Jed Wolchok was the first author, uh, was, well, was the senior author, but the presenting author of the phase three data that showed such good toxicity profiles comparatively. And again, the, the red line got moved down. Um, but what's really important is that 90% of patients had clinically had at least one clinically significant immune-mediated adverse event. 60% of patients had grade three, four immune-related adverse events. That's a lot. That's almost two out of every three patients have grade three or four. Um, the majority of patients required steroids. Um, that's 72%. It's so not a small amount. Um, almost a quarter of patients didn't respond to steroids when they had diarrhea. Um, those who did experience diarrhea, half of them didn't respond to steroids and needed to have infliximab, which is both hugely expensive as well as can be a battle in the community to be able to get the GIs to allow you to prescribe it. Um, and 63% of patients needed to go to the emergency room. That's a lot of patients. And um, Almost half of patients had at least one hospitalization, and almost all of these hospitalizations, by and large, were related to immune-mediated adverse events. I spoke to Dr. Wolchuk about these cases. I said, why was only 70% of them related to immune-mediated adverse events? What were the other 30%? He said that about half of them were due to progressive disease, um, and the other half were due to immune-mediated adverse events that the doctors still won't admit were actually immune-mediated adverse events. So these rates are probably somewhat higher. Um, another important thing is that if you if you get a really bad immune-mediated adverse event with the combination, you do end up getting, you can't really restart them on single agent. So you lose your chance. Um, this is a lower dose. So this is an early article that was looking at a different dose of ipilimumab plus nivolumab to be able to determine whether uh, you can get away from an efficacy and safety perspective with giving um, lower doses of ipilimumab and higher doses of PD-1 um, in the same setting. Um, and in this, this, they use pembrolizumab instead of nivolumab, but in general, it's the same. It's a single arm study that was presented, I think, by Georgina Long at ASCO this past year. And um, what it showed was you still had a very high rate of treatment-related adverse events. 42% of patients had, um, had grade three, four adverse events that were considered treatment-related. Only 25% had immune-mediated, but I'm not really exactly sure what type of treatment-related adverse event you would have if it wasn't immune-mediated. And so those data, it would be interesting to see the publication. Um, there were no deaths associated, but many led to, uh, to, um, to discontinuation of, of, of the drugs earlier than they otherwise would have wanted to. And you can see that there was quite a number of patient, patients who had colitis, a number of hepatitis, a few pneumonitis. And this is important because there isn't such a thing as a truly safe combination of a CTLA-4 plus PD-1. The rates are lower as you manipulate the doses, but the risk doesn't go down. And the risks can be bizarre, and we'll talk about that in a second. So 
why were steroids uh, why were steroids held in this patient for so long? And the the question really comes down to why are steroids ever held? Why are we not giving steroids right off the bat when we see somebody with shortness of breath in who had PD-1 or a combination PD-1 CTLA-4 uh, inhibition? Um, and there are three reasons. The first is something that the drug companies talk about a lot, which is a low index of suspicion. In my early version of the slide, I called this doctor chemo brain. We are very used to treating patients with chemotherapy, and as a result, our go-to list of causes of anything always are chemotherapy-related causes. If a patient has an infiltrate, that's pneumonia. If a patient has a fever, that's an infection. If the patient has diarrhea, that's because of chemotherapy. That's not the case in immunotherapy at all. It is more likely that a patient who develops diarrhea with immunotherapy is having it because of an autoimmune colitis than because of any sort of uh, 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 direct toxicity to the uh, to the colon. Um, it is much more likely even that a patient, at least with melanoma, is developing pneumonitis rather than pneumonia. Um, in patients who have lung cancer, it can be a little bit complicated and it can be hard to be able to tease out progression of disease from infectious pneumonia that could be post-obstructive from immune therapy, but the index of suspicion has to be high. And generally, just like with meningitis, it doesn't necessarily hurt to give antibiotics and steroids. Um, if you really want to cover your bases. The second reason that we often see delays in starting steroids is that they don't happen when we think they're going to happen. The, uh, the side effects that happen with these, with these uh, side effects, uh, with, uh, with these agents, don't always happen when we would expect. They don't always happen during the therapy. Sometimes they happen early, sometimes they happen late, sometimes they happen even after the completion of the therapy. This is a patient who received all of their ipilimumab. So the doctor believed that they were out of the woods in terms of toxicity, and yet they developed a side effect a couple of weeks later, uh, and that was due to the ipilimumab. And we'll talk about that for a second. And there's also an unwritten and unfounded concern that giving steroids is going to make the immunotherapy stop working. So let's look at the data for that a little bit. So the, this is a poster that was presented uh, that I actually already spoke about, which is in, in the community of off-study Sloan Kettering patients, which again, I think we would all laugh about that that's not exactly a community setting. Um, but what you can see is that the side effects that happened with combination therapy in their community setting, most of them happened not in the first cycle, um, and more than half of them happened after the second cycle. So you can see that different side effects happen at any different time. The, the colitis tends to happen during cycle two, but I've seen colitis that can happen six months after ipilimumab is finished, that responded to steroids and, and were clearly autoimmune. Um, so the take home message from this sort of all over the place plot is that these, once you've gone on in immunotherapy, the likelihood of you ever developing immunotherapy related side effects is not zero and should always be considered. Um, so what about patients who get steroids? Do they do, what happens to them? Um, and are you, are you attenuating the effect of the therapy by doing this? So this was a, uh, a, pub, a paper also that was presented at, um, not a paper, I'm sorry, a poster that was presented at uh, ASCO this past year by Steve Hody and, and Jed Wolchuk, um, showing that patients who stopped the therapy with nivolumab plus ipilimumab as a result of autoimmune side effects had objective response rates that were the same as, if not slightly better than, those patients who did not, which leads one to believe that this might be an on-target effect and that when you develop a robust immune response, that actually means that you're going to have a response in your tumor more likely. Um, stopping this because of steroids and starting steroids doesn't seem to matter much. Patients who got steroids did just as well as patients who didn't. So if a patient's having symptoms that are severe enough to warrant getting steroids, it does not hurt the patient's chance of, of developing a response. Um, these are patients uh, looking not just at objective response rate, but also PFS, and it shows that the patients that discontinued due to AEs, um, and presumably most of them got steroids, had the same PFS curve as, uh, as those who were, as the total who were randomized. And overall survival was basically the same as well. Um, in fact, the patients who uh, the patients who had to stop because of AEs, if anything, had numerically higher rates of survival than the all randomized patients. 
Now, this is not a one-to-one. -one. We don't exactly know. This study was not looking at only those patients who received steroids. And it also doesn't tell us exactly the right time to, as to when to start steroids. There might be some patients that were giving steroids to inappropriately that maybe are not having an autoimmune event. So if the, one might argue, and, and to play devil's advocate, well, if a patient's having a side effect that might not be autoimmune, maybe then giving steroids would be detrimental to their likelihood of ultimately achieving a response. Because the only data that exists are patients who we know had to stop therapy, not patients who we don't know what's going on with them. And so as a result, people sometimes are a little bit slow to prescribe steroids. And the truth is we don't know whether or not it's harmful or not. However, all of these data should be somewhat reassuring to the practicing oncologist that giving steroids isn't going to hurt the patient most likely and in many ways might actually save their lives. So let's talk about a second case. And this is a rare side effect that, we're, that, that I saw in the hospital when I was rounding, um, but is important because the index of suspicion for anything weird should be high. This is a patient who's a 63-year-old man um, with melanoma and brain metastases. Um, six weeks prior to his admission, he had gamma knife treatment for his brain met. He was started on single agent pembrolizumab, got his first dose two weeks prior to this hospitalization. About a week later, he started developing blurry vision and headache and shortness of breath. Um, about three days before admission, he started having really bad shortness of breath. Um, he, uh, they actually performed a physical exam in the emergency room, which was very exciting. And, um, and it showed a mild lid lag in both eyes um, with a normal respiratory exam. He had a CT of his chest that showed basically what at that point was his known melanoma in the right lower lobe and no other abnormalities. And the, the MRI of his brain to see whether or not there was something neuro, neuromuscular going on, and there was really nothing else going on other than his improving brain mass after gamma knife. Um, his history is notable for uh, the fact that he presented initially in 2014 with an ulcerated melanoma of his scalp. He had wide local excision and neck dissection. He went on to a clinical trial that we had available at our center with vemurafenib as compared to placebo. We still do not know which one he received. And then about eight months after he started the trial, he developed asymptomatic brain meds, and it was required to do MRIs on this study, and so that's how we found it. Um, his pathology was notable for a very aggressive primary malignancy um, that was uh, 18 millimeters deep, and remember that a T4 designation is anything greater than four millimeters. So this is a very, very deep melanoma that was ulcerated, um, highly mitotic. Uh, his sentinel lymph node biopsy showed one positive node um, that, was, that showed some extra capsular extension, and he had a BRAF V600K mutation, which you guys might remember um, is responsive to BRAF agents, but not as responsive as V600E. His clinical course, um, he was admitted and neurology was consulted. Um, he was started on uh, peridostigmine, and so he was not started right away on steroids because there was a concern that he might have pneumonia, and a myasthenia gravis panel was ordered. Um, on day three of hospitalization, the concern for pneumonia had gone down enough for them to feel like they should give prednisone, and they gave him 60 milligrams a day of prednisone, and they started him on IVIG um, because of a concern that he has, um, uh, that he has uh, myasthenia. On day six, his acetylcholine receptor antibody came back positive, and he was also at that time given a gram of solumedrol every single day. Um, the next day, after the neurologist saw it, they recommended plasmapheresis, and he started getting plasmapheresis. Two days later, he had not had any clinical improvement whatsoever, even with the plasmapheresis, IVIG, mestinon, and, um, and high-dose steroids, and he was intubated. And on day 12, he, he opted to stop therapy and was terminally extubated. So what was going on with this patient? So this was one of those cases where the patient did what more or less the, the the diagnosis was found. It was found in a relatively quick fashion. And despite maximal therapy, both from a uh, immune targeting therapy as well as from any other targeting therapy that you can think of, uh, was achieved, and yet the patient still had a poor outcome. So what, when do we think of myasthenia, and when do we think that these are going to be autoimmune side effects when we see them or not? So there was a study that was looked at um, in, uh, that was published recently in the European Journal of Cancer. Can of cancer. Of cancer. I, I cancered my subscription to that journal. And um, sorry about that. And uh, they looked at about 500 consecutive patients treated in 15 different centers. They saw a ton of different uh, autoimmune side effects. 77 of 138 patients that, that, um, that developed autoimmune side effects. 
showed uh, some of these bizarre findings. Um, about 1.6% had ocular adverse events, and those adverse events um, included iritis, uh, uveitis, conjunctivitis, um, and they saw all of them, and almost all of these resolved when they had uh, achieved them. Um, and those were for eye events. But what about really rare side effects and what are the sequelae? So this was the patient, this was published in the European Journal of Cancer, and this was a patient that was 69 years old. Um, this is not our patient that we treated in the hospital, this is the patient that the European Journal, uh, of, the European Journal of Cancer reported. And this was the little lag that they saw. Um, and this patient also saw a, uh, this, the development of, this, this, of these symptoms soon after starting the PD-1 inhibitor. There was another report of myasthenia gravis that was reported in the very first PDL1 paper that was written by Brommer et al. Um, and uh, sorry, and that also showed a myasthenia patient. That patient um, in the Brommer article, they said uh, was resolved, but when you actually dug down into the data, it showed that that patient also ultimately deceased of their disease. And this patient that you're looking at on this slide in the European Journal of Cancer it was reported to have also never had relief of symptoms and also succumbed to their disease. So of the N of three that I have, myasthenia related to uh, PD-1 inhibitors carries a pretty dismal prognosis. How do we keep an index of suspicion that's high for these things and what do we do? Um, this case again, one could argue that steroids were started too late. The likelihood of a patient who had gotten pembrolizumab for the very first time developing a pneumonia is extremely low. Um, there was nothing that was seen in the, uh, other than the right lower lobe nodule, which was a known, uh, known melanoma, um, nothing was seen. Um, and so steroids probably should have been started right away. However, with the ultimate diagnosis that this patient had, it's not clear that that would have really helped. But this is a very rare side effect, and yet anything can happen. Um, and that's what the teaching point is from this case, is even though my, myasthenia does not end in itis, it's still an itis. It is a uh, manifestation of an autoimmune side effect because of the acetylcholine uh, uh, inhibitor, uh, acetylcholine receptor inhibitor, and, uh, and as a result is due and was due in this case to the pembrolizumab's effect. And you can see that happen with anything. We've seen type 1 diabetes occur. We've seen any type, type of thyroid disease occur. Um, I've seen drug-related uh, lupus occur um, as a result of it. Anything that can be an itis can occur. So the third case is a case where it's a little bit more like what we see in the clinic. The first two cases are a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking. I know what happened and I know what should have been done. This is a case where things are a little bit more vague. This is a 62-year-old man with non-small cell lung cancer. Um, when he was uh, diagnosed, he already had vertebral mets. Um, and he was treated with pembrolizumab since uh, September of 2015. He started having progressive lower back pain in February of this past year after being on treatment for about four months. His pain was worse at night and it begins in the lower back. And then he started having paresthesias with uh, numbness for 20 seconds. And when sensation returned, it came back with excruciating pain in his back and his legs. It, um, we thought that it was due to vertebral nets, which were known in the uh, lumbar and sacral area. And so he was referred to radiation, um, but radiation didn't cause, uh, didn't help. Um, by April, he was weak in his lower extremities and was not able to walk. Um, his lung cancer was a relatively advanced lung cancer at the time of diagnosis. Um, he had T4, M3, M1 disease. Um, however, he had an excellent response to first-line pembrolizumab. He had 90% resolution of all of his soft tissue lesions. Um, his right upper lobe lesion and all of his pleural lesions were basically melting away after even a few cycles. Um, his vertebral nets looked like they were stable throughout the course, although it's very hard to be able to see response in bone, and sometimes you, there is response by biopsy that you don't see by radiology, as you all know. Um, this patient didn't have any history of autoimmune disease, no arthritis, no radiculopathy. Um, he did have a high PD-L1 status, um, and he had not had any previous therapy. This patient was also treated on a, on a frontline PD-1 uh, trial um, as a single agent, uh, and that was based on the fact that his pd one status was greater than 50%. Um, and the rest of his major tumor markers were negative. His EGFR was wild type, his ALF was negative. And so after he completed RT, um, he continued to have increased pain. He started getting diaphoretic and tachycardic. Um, we ruled out PE. And finally, we just said, look, we don't know what's going on here. Let's stop the pembrolizumab as well. 
He was hospitalized a number of times um, and had extensive neurology workup. Um, he was referred out even to the Mayo Clinic to be able to and Vanderbilt University in order to be able to see whether or not they could figure out if there was a perineoplastic syndrome going on. He had a lumbar puncture that showed high protein, low glucose, and negative cytology. Um, so it looked like nonspecific inflammation. He then started developing encephalopathy. Um, we assumed that he had carcinomatous meningitis, um, and he was started on um, on uh, deficit injections and has is still getting these injections. Um, after starting um, after starting a deficit, they also started him on high dose steroids in case this was a pembrolizumab map side effect. We had a slow taper, and he had slight improvement of symptoms, but continued pain. Um, and his symptoms did improve for a few months, and now they're getting worse again. Um, we repeated the LP on him in July, just a couple of months ago, and now we see cytology positive for malignant cells. So was this immunotherapy related, or was this disease progression related? When did the immunotherapy stop working? Did the immun immunotherapy actually work, but not penetrate the blood-brain blood barrier, which ultimately led to progression in the patient's CNS? We don't know. These are new drugs. Um, and we also don't know, I don't know what we could have done differently to figure out whether or not this was carcinomatous meningitis from the beginning, or this was an autoimmune sort of Guillain-Barre type uh, symptoms that we can see, which have been seen, by the way, in the past. How do we treat it? I, unfortunately, what we're stuck with is we end up sometimes treating two different disease processes that might be competing with one another. And what do we do when we don't know? And the, the main teaching point and the main learning point for all of us is to admit when we don't know, because these are drugs that we just don't have enough long-term follow-up to really understand all of the cases of yet, and to have a high index of suspicion for autoimmune disease. And with that, I'm, going, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I think that I left about 10 minutes or so for questions, and so I'll stop there. Great. So thank you again so much, Dr. Vanderwell, and we do have some audience questions. So the first one is, what is the current thinking about markers to predict response to different immunotherapies? Are there results with gene expression profiles and mutational load that are encouraging? Um, the answer to that question is yes, and I don't know what to do about them yet. So there have been a number of different uh, studies that have been published in journals that, that clinical oncologists don't often read, like Cancer Research and Nature and things like that, looking at both, um, at both immune signatures as well as genetic signatures. Um, there's a, uh, a number of different markers out there that have been developed by a number of different laboratories, like the IPRES test. Um, there's uh, mutational load tests that have been performed as well. It's still the early days and we don't know. It doesn't help that melanoma medical oncologists tend to be more immunologists than they are uh, structural biologists. So looking for targets is, is a little bit different in the immunology field. Um, we don't have any marker that is better right now clinically than PDL1. The problem, unfortunately, is that PDL1 is a terrible marker. Um, every different company has a different PDL1 assay that they use. BMS's assay, which uh, none of these are publicly available, but BMS's assay sees about 30 to 40 percent positive in, uh, I'm sorry, about uh, 40 to 50 percent positive with melanoma, and Merck's assay shows about 90 percent positive with melanoma. I don't know anything about AstraZeneca's or EMD Serrano's or Genentech's. Genentech uses a different, um, I, I don't know what, what, uh, what assay they use. But they look at the difference between PDL1 expression both on the tumor cells as well as on the immune infiltrating cells, and that can make a difference with response as well. So, in terms of being ready for prime time, we really don't have anything. The question becomes is PDL1, which is the closest to being ready for prime time, is that something that we can use in our clinics now? And because, it, in my practice, because of the, what I consider to be the danger of combination immunotherapy, I use it um, to be able to justify giving the combination when it's PDL1 negative. Um, when it's PDL1 positive, though, I, in melanoma at least, I will err on the side of giving single agent CD1 therapy. So while not entirely prime time, it's the best that we have. And I'm so nervous about the combination in my practice that I'll look for any excuse I can to not give it. All right, thanks. And then speaking of combination therapy, so when using combination checkpoint inhibitor therapy, 
is patient compliance becoming an issue as a result of the associated increase in toxicities? Um, so thankfully, no. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, the first of which is that there are two phases of the combination. The first is the first 12 weeks where the patients are getting uh, are getting uh, are, are getting ipilimumab plus nivolumab, and then that's done, and afterwards they go on to nivolumab. So getting patients through the first 12 weeks is not as hard as putting patients on what would be combination therapy for years and years. The second is that the relationship between the side effects and the drug is not as obvious. Um, very often, as I said, more than half of the studies, uh, more than half of the patients will uh, only start developing severe side effects in the third or later dose. Most patients are able to get full doses of, of the combination. Um, the question becomes how far into the single agent PD-1 are they able to get. Um, and then generally speaking, these, most of the patients are excited enough about what's been published about immunotherapy's efficacy to, and have intuited this, this sense of if you develop side effects, it might mean the drug is going to work, um, which I'm not sure is true, but seems to be Patients tend to think that, at least in my practice, um, and there aren't data to contradict that. So generally, patients are pretty compliant with it. If anything, we need to be careful that, the, that we don't listen to our patients when they want to not be compliant. If a patient is experiencing severe diarrhea and says, you know, doc, I'm not sure I should get the next dose, listen to them. Don't call that patient noncompliance. <laughs> think of that more as appropriate patient caution. Um, and so th that's Listening to the patients in this regard is, is usually pretty pretty good. Um, the, the other question about compliance really has more to do with cost than anything else. Uh, these drugs are exceedingly expensive. Um, even just giving the first four doses of, of these drugs is almost $200,000. So you can have a financial noncompliance that can occur with this as well, and that can be really complicated. In my experience, insurance companies haven't balked at paying for the combination. The data is good enough from an efficacy perspective to allow people to give the combination of melanoma, um, but it can really, I mean, it's a hard bill to get. All right, thank you. And I think we have time for just one more question. So, um, Dr. Manuel, how difficult is it to differentiate between progressive disease, disease and pseudoprogression when treating patients with melanoma and immunotherapy? Um, so, that's a very complicated and difficult question to answer. Um, first of all, I, I just want to pivot a little bit and say that pseudoprogression, I think, is an invention of a drug company who doesn't want us to think that that progression is actually real progression and wants to continue treating with the drug. Um, pseudoprogression is a misnomer. It's, there are two reasons that diseases grow um, after giving immunotherapy. The first reason is because you have a huge amount of immune infiltration that goes into the tumor. Um, and and as a result, it looks bigger than it actually is because you're actually seeing inflammation. And that's what the companies are calling pseudoprogression. The second reason that they grow, and this is still consistent with ultimately responding, is because they just grow. Immune therapy doesn't, hit, doesn't make the cancer hit a brick wall. Um, immune therapy puts the brakes on. So the cancer will continue to grow for a little while before it actually starts to respond because that's how the immune system works. Um, I would say that the majority of the time, the overwhelming majority of the time that you see a growth in the cancer, you're seeing progression. Now, does that mean that the patient is ultimately going to respond or not? It's not clear. Um, with ipilimumab, about half of responses that were seen with ipilimumab ultimately, um, about half, I'm sorry, about half of the responses that were seen showed, showed progression prior to achieving response. That sounds like Maybe it was great. That's good. That means half the patients who show progression are going to respond. Well, actually, no, it doesn't. It just means that those who ultimately responded, half of them had progression first. That, from a practicing perspective, doesn't help us at all because that doesn't give us a pretest probability. It only gives us a post-test probability. If you do the math, if there was only a 20% response rate, that means that if you showed progression, there's only a 1 in 9, one in nine chance that those patients will ultimately respond um, with ipi map. So and I can repeat that if anybody wants to hear it again, if you only have a 20% ultimate response rate with ipilimumab and half of those patients show progression first, that means that if you show progression at your first scan, you're going to be in one of those 90% of patients that show progression at their first scan, 
only 10% of them ultimately all go on to respond. So only one in nine patients who show progression of their first scan ultimately go on to respond. It's different with the PD-1s. Um, PD-1s, very often you'll start seeing a turnaround very quickly. Um, patients who have pseudoprogression on the first scan with ipilimumab, and the first scan is usually done at eight, at, at, oh, I'm sorry, with nivolumab or pembrolizumab. Um, the first scan is usually done at eight to 12 weeks. You can see some pseudoprogression in there. What I recommend doing is repeating a scan four weeks later. If the disease is still growing four weeks later, they're not going to respond. Um, they're actually progressing. Um, that'll capture almost 95% of the patients if you do it that way. Um, if the disease is stable four weeks later and they're symptomatically fine, I would continue. And if the disease is looking better four weeks later, then absolutely continue. But even then, um, if you have a patient who's showing progression at the eight or 12 week scan, you're still likely that that patient is ultimately going to progress. Um, the majority of patients do respond. The majority of patients who respond do respond by, um, by that first scan with PD-1 inhibitors. And that's true with the combination as well. Okay. Great. Well, thank you again, Dr. Van Wall, for the presentation and for that excellent Q&A. And again, thank you so much to our audience for participating. Um, both the webinar slides and the recording will be available on our website shortly. And um, as a registrant, everyone will receive an email with the link as well. And last but not least, I hope you'll, you'll check out the iCLEO conference agenda and register next week in Philadelphia. Uh, thank you, everyone, and have a great weekend.